I, I was planning to present a paper, but I'm going to do to present two papers. Um, I couldn't decide in the end. I was feeling very thorn about. Uh, but a lot of the work I've been doing is trying to understand inequality uh, that arises really early on uh, in, the, in the lives of uh, children. Uh, and I think that uh, here in this environment, most people are familiar with the Hart and Risley study uh, that they followed for uh, about 40, uh, 40 children for a period of three years recording um, the language development and the environment that these children were uh, experienced early on. Um, when I read this book, I was deeply interested in um, trying to understand how credit constraints uh, might influence um, inequality in investments. And I quickly realized that credit constraints along the lines that I was studying would be very hard to actually explain what I was reading Hart and Risley, which led me to try to understand different, uh, different explanations for the same things. Um, so here's the basic idea is that uh, this is the number of different words children actually had uh, uh, um, uh, expressed uh, uh, from basically age 10 months to age 36 months. Um, and the story that Hart and Risley would like you to know is that by age 36 months, the vocabulary size of the welfare children were the same vocabulary size of the higher SES children when they were 24 months old, which is already by age three years, it's already in this measure one year of developmental delay. And they, their best explanation of why this thing happened is because of the language environment these children were exposed to. And this is the language environment of the welfare children. It's about, they're hearing about 700 words. Most of the words that they're hearing are negative words. Um, and here's the language environment of the higher SES kids, which already starts at about 1,500 words per hour. And it goes to about 2,500 words per hour. And most of the inequality is being driven because these guys here are initiating more conversations. Um, just to give you a sense, I'm speaking to you at a rate of about 300 words per minute. So five minutes of my talking to you is how many words these guys were hearing at a high talking time during the day for them. Okay, so, and these guys here, this is um, about two minutes of my talking to you. Uh, so another work that really influenced me was uh, Ariel Khalil and uh, co-author's paper on time use of kids. We, uh, we study a lot of uh, differences in time use across um, groups, but what really was interesting is that Ariel went back and said, you know, when kids are two years old, the types of skills that they are learning are really about bonding with an adult person. We shouldn't be uh, teaching them, you know, um, maximum likelihood estimation when they're two years old. That's too difficult for them. Uh, but we should be talking to them, we should be uh, playing with them, and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And Ariel was pointing out that at that age, the largest gap in time use was exactly minutes in play, which is the type of skill, the type of investment that is so important for the types of skills that are being formed. She then went on to look at the time use of kids when they were three to five years old. Uh, and then at that stage is when we actually want to start preparing kids to go to school. So teaching them certain numbers, certain uh, uh, notions of shape, sizes, uh, colors, letters, numbers. This is school readiness kind of stuff. And when is the time use largest? At three to five is exactly, uh, uh, for minutes in teaching, is exactly three to five when the, we are preparing the kids to go to, um, to school. And then six to 13 is the time in which what you want to do is to make sure that uh, children understand that they have to start planning and doing things, right? So you don't want to be, uh, doing the homework for them, but you want to make sure that they actually do the homework. So this is what she's going to do called uh, time management. And at what age is the gap the largest? Again, it's 6 to 13. Um, this is a notion that there may be things that higher income parents know about child development that lower income parents actually don't know about child development. This is a fascinating topic, but to my surprise, um, no economists have actually put together a model in which parents don't know um, how the process of development actually happens. The other thing that I want to pay attention to is that we talk a lot about differences across socioeconomic groups, but there are differences within socioeconomic groups that are no way 
not significant. Okay, so this is time. This is uh, data from uh, the um, uh, PSID, uh, the Child Developmental uh, uh, um, uh, Supplement. This is uh, hours per day in uh, uh, playing activities because the kids here are uh, zero to two years old. And what you see, yes, these are the lowest income parents. These are the highest income parents. Uh, the mode is well below for these guys and these guys. But you do have a distribution. You do have about 30% of the low income parents that actually are about the mode for the high income parents. Okay, so there is a large inequality in, uh, in investments, and it's particularly larger for the lower income uh, families, which is a super interesting understudied topic. Uh, in Philadelphia, we started a, a project a few years ago, uh, we're continuing to this day, which tries to formalize the notion of what it means to say that parents don't know uh, about child development, the process of child development. I'm going to call it beliefs. I'm going to go through this today uh, in uh, part of my talk. And uh, what really was fascinating to me is to see that beliefs measured when parents were uh, in the first pregnancy uh, actually predicted investment at nine months old. We uh, went back and collected data when the kids are now 24 months old. And if anything, the predictive power beliefs measured at pregnancy is greater at 24 months than it was at uh, nine months. Um, so one of the notions that I'm trying to, that I've, uh, that I've been doing uh, recently is, can we change parental beliefs? And if we change parental beliefs, can we change investments? Okay, so that's, that's the type of research I've been engaging in the last few years. And particularly this formation of this notion of uh, uh, knowing about child development can happen in two places uh, in uh, uh, typical economic uh, uh, um, structures. One is preferences. Um, typical preferences uh, that we, uh, one would write is that parents care about uh, consumption of the family and, uh, let's say, child development. Today I'm going to say that this, there is another element in this production function, which is parents have some notion about what they think is the appropriate level of child development at every particular age. And they are particularly concerned about child development if they forecast that their children will not reach that level, that minimum level that is appropriate. Okay, so that, that is capturing one notion of beliefs. And the way I say this is that parents have um, non-rational expectations about, uh, about these, uh, these reference points. So um, they have, for example, a notion that uh, a log of this, uh, 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 th this quantity here is normally distributed with some mean and some variance. But this mean and variance is not the mean and variance that psychologists attribute is normal. Uh, they are forming this information based on peers that they are looking at. And this might actually influence the amount of investment that you're going to have. And um, it's going to be the simplest model in terms of uh, uh, resources. So they can either invest or consume. They have center income. And here's the notion of, uh, here's a, another place where beliefs are going to play a role, which is going to be the production function of human capital. I'm going to work with the uh, simplest production function that I can work, which is the Cobb Douglas specification. Then human capital at the end of the period is going to be a function of human capital at the beginning of the period, human capital at um, uh, sorry, investments in human capital, and then a narrow term that I is the entire problem because it's uh, observed by parents but not by you, by, by us, so therefore it's correlated with this guy here, which usually would bring us problems. But today it's going to be much worse than this because I'm going to assume that parents may not know what gamma zero, gamma one, and gamma two is going to be. Parents have beliefs about what these parameters are going to be. I'm going to elicit those beliefs from them. And I'm going to say from the point of view of a, a parent, a particular parent, I'm going to assume that it has a mean and it has a variance. Today, the variance is not going to play a role. And I don't need to assume that it's normal. I can assume, I, I don't need to make a, a distribution assumptions. But just to write down the model and have closed form solutions for some of the things I'm going to present to you today, I'm going to assume right now that it's normal. But I'm going to walk away from this in a second. Um, here's the solution of this problem. So the parent has an information set, um, omega, that has the prices of investment, uh, the parent's income, the child's development. A lot of people would say parents may not even know this guy here, so they may have the wrong assessment of the current uh, development of the child is going to be. Um, so 
this would itself be a problem. Today I'm going to assume that parents know exactly what H0 is. This is a shock that may influence uh, 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 skill formation, uh, is the source of uh, endogeneity. Uh, this is the belief about the reference point in preference. This is the belief about uh, 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 each one of the parameters in the production function. And, the, uh, and here is usually we would ignore these components here in the typical models in economics that we write. We would say, let's just uh, assume that parents know, let's assume parents don't actually have reference points. So this would go away. And let's assume that parents know the production function. And then this component here would go away as well. Okay, so this would not be a part of that. I'm going to bring each one of them back, and it's going to create a serious uh, identification problem. I'll, so, I'll show you how we can actually do this. Why, do, um, why does this matter? The typical textbook model uh, would have two constraints, which is a combination of the budget constraint with the production function of human capital. Um, the budget constraint is shifting this up or, or down, and then the production function is affecting the curvature here. Okay, this is the story that's going on. Um, the typical model would say, uh, we're gonna uh, search for a point in which these two curves are actually tangent, which would be this level. What I'm saying is, no, no, no. First is, parents, even though this is the actual constraint that they are facing, their beliefs are telling them, this is not the constraint that I'm facing. It's the red line is the constraint that I'm facing. And in this case, what I'm gonna choose is not this point, which would indicate this level of child development and this level of consumption. Instead, I'm going to choose this point, which is a lower point of child development and a higher point for consumption. That's what's going on here. And the other story that I'm gonna tell, the reference point is, you can think about this as two selves. Everyone has two identities, if you will. One identity really cares a lot about child development, not so much about household consumption. Another identity really cares a lot about consumption, not so much about child development. These two uh, indifference curves, uh, they cross exactly at that reference point. This is the uh, 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 indifference curve that describes uh, utility functions of these, uh, these parents. And then given the constraint that they face, even if they knew exactly what the production function is going to be, parents that have different, different beliefs about the production function are going to choose different points. Uh, so a parent that cares a lot more, that has higher reference points, will actually choose levels of investment that induce higher, higher levels of uh, child development. And parents that care less about, that have lower beliefs about uh, uh, the reference point will actually invest less and therefore have lower levels of child development. Yeah. Just as a clarification, if you go back to that yeah. slide. No, no, this, this is literally only this part here. At this, at this, at this, I don't have, here I don't have the reference point yet. Okay. Okay? But, uh, like in that distribution, I mean, could we, could we wind up with, with a, a similar one that actually kind of, I mean, in some sense you're saying it's going to, they're going to be inside what the production possibilities criteria is. They ha always have to be. Okay. The belief, yeah, I mean, uh, I can't believe. No, they can be actually no. The opposite, could be the, the, the opposite could be happening. And actually, my own my own prior beliefs when I started this work is that they're going to be overestimating how much they can do for their child if they invest. And and the reason why is I thought well, there's this entire literature on birth uh, birth order effects, and a literature in which you have uncertainty about the parameters of the production function. Investing a lot on the first child is good, not only because you care about the first child's human capital level, but you're also learning a lot about what can I actually accomplish, right? And we've done, we had done a lot of uh, focus groups with high income parents, and they described to us, you know, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try many different things which would lead to a lot of investment, right? That's not the dynamics that we're finding in the low income families, okay? So I'll tell you this, uh, but yes, it's an empirical question where you're going to end up, but you certainly cannot be at this point here. I mean, this is a fascinating conversation that I've had with many parents that email me, that they say, I would like my child to be Einstein. How do I do this? And I say, it may not be feasible. <laughs> not a lot of parents actually like to hear that, but it's not an unusual email that I get, unfortunately, okay? But they have to be within the, uh, the frontier, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, 
But here's the situation in which you combine both. Um, so, right, I mean, this is no uncertainty about the production function, no, the right beliefs about the production function, two different re reference points, but there is no reason why these things cannot be correlated. You can have, right, uh, today, unfortunately, I'm going to shut down. When I talk about the first paper, I'm going to only attack uncertainty about the production function. When I talk about the first, second paper, I'm only going to talk about reference points. We're not building up the data to, to analyze both at the same time. Um, uh, but not yet. Okay, so two papers. The, the first paper is going to talk about, it's with uh, Horatio uh, Atanasio and Pamela Jervis. Um, and it truly is about can a, a home visitation change mean beliefs about the uh, technology parameters uh, and therefore investment. And the second one is really uh, can a, a randomized control trial affect par uh, uh, parental uh, beliefs about reference points. Um, so that, that's the story. I'll try to be as, um, as, as clear about both papers uh, as I can. So, so I, I joined this project. This is a, this is a, a project that Horacio Atanasio, Costas Megir, and, uh, and uh, Sally Grantham McGregor had in Colombia. Uh, I joined this in the last year of their study. Uh, what they actually did is Sally Grantham McGregor had the, in the 1980s in Jamaica, a really high quality home visitation program. And uh, people are still analyzing data uh, to this point. This was done in the 1980s. The kids now are close to 30 years old. Uh, Gertler published a paper in 2014 showing that these kids when they were about 20 had higher education attainment, higher income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, long term impact of this program. So what they, and then Athanasio uh, McGear and Se, uh, Sally uh, uh, Greta McGregor adapted the curriculum for Colombia, but it's a particular context in Colombia because uh, Atanasio approached the Colombian government because he found out that the government had been doing a home visitation program that had no curriculum whatsoever. So he told them, why don't we randomly select a few of these areas and instead of having a home visitation program that has no curriculum whatsoever, we actually use a curriculum that, has, that is validated in terms of long-term impacts. So treatment gets Jamaica's uh, adapted curriculum. Control gets whatever home visitation program that they have. There's almost no difference in the quality of the workforce during this program. So whatever change they found, and they found uh, that the program impacted uh, uh, cognitive skills by about 20% of standard deviation, um, is truly due, 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 due just because of, uh, uh, of the uh, curriculum and the kinds of activities. The other thing that they found out was that Households had increased home investments, even though income was not different, parental education was not different, nothing was different. So they couldn't explain why parental investment was actually greater at uh, treatment versus control groups uh, um, um, because of the, certainly because of the intervention, but they didn't have an explanation of what were the things that led the, uh, uh, what, was the what were the variables that led uh, families to in, uh, increase investment in the uh, treatment villages. So here's the study. So baseline, they did a measurement of age zero, uh, which is the Bailey uh, score, Bailey scale of infant development and MacArthur Bates language scale. And then they, once they collected the data, they assigned villages to either control or treatment. Uh, 18 months after the, uh, after the beginning of the program, they went back and did the first follow-up. They collected again uh, measures on uh, uh, child development and measures on parental investments. Uh, and then they did a second follow-up 18 months later, and then they did again uh, measures of child development, measures of um, uh, investment, and then this is where we actually enter with the belief questions. Um, so this is not the ideal scenario. We would have liked to start here, but I had not started this work on beliefs until uh, they had already they were already planning to start to do this work here. Um, so what what this is easy, very easy. So here's what, here's the story. Um, this is what parents think for every scenario of human capital at baseline and investments between baseline and end line. This is what they think human capital is going to be, right? And condition on H0 and X1 and the information set of the parent, that means that their belief about gamma zero is going to be mu zero. Their beliefs about gamma one is going to be mu one. 
the beliefs about gamma 2 is going to be mu 2. Okay, so the exercise in this paper is how do I actually ask, uh, elicit from parents what they think mu 0 is, mu 1, and mu 2. What doesn't work is what is mu 0. That, that doesn't work. Um, most immediate question you can, they can't actually answer. The way this is going to be done is very simple. So you create scenarios for this variable and this variable. And then you ask parents questions in the same, from the same scales that you're going to measure child development. You ask them questions, what do you think, this, what is the probability this child is going to learn this item if H0 is this value and X is that other value, okay? And then you change the scenarios and you ask the same items again. And you change the scenarios and you ask the items again. And you change the scenarios and you ask the items again. You have three parameters that you want to identify for each person. You need to have at least four questions. You don't want to have only four questions because of measurement error. You want to have more than that. Okay, so, so, so what you're going to see is a method that elicits, asks the same parents 12 questions. All of them are going to get this answer from them. And then what we're going to do is we're going to regress whatever answer that they, get, they give me here, we're going to regress against an intercept H0 and X1 plus an error term. And then that's, well, we're going to do this regression person by person. That's going to tell us, what, tell us what my mu0, my mu1, and my mu2 is going to be. And then I'm going to say, do these variables correlate with anything we're interested in uh, or not? Okay. Um, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. I'm going to go through it because um, because of measurement error. So you want to be sure that you address measurement error in a model that is um, uh, flexible enough. So here's the step one. Uh, for in Philadelphia, when we did this, we literally asked probability questions. In uh, Colombia, where the median level of education was four years among this population, this didn't work so well. So instead of asking probability questions, we asked age questions. So I'm going to now do everything that you see in here, all of the measures of child development, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is translate everything in terms of developmental age, okay? That's the first thing that I'm going to do because I want to make sure that whatever answer I get from the moms, I can relate to the measure of human capital that, I'm, that we're using the objective uh, measure. So think of instead of working with the standardized uh, test that has mean zero and variance one, what you're going to have is a variance a mean that has a certain, that is located at a certain age, and a variance that means something in terms of uh, age of uh, development as well. Happy to talk more about this. Step two, you're going to have now an hybrid uh, IRT model. This hybrid IRT, uh, IRT model is going to have a continuous measure that is a function of the human capital that you're interested in. If it's baseline, this t is 0. If it's follow-up 1, this t is 1. If it's follow-up 2, this t is 2. And then an error term. And then you have another component, which is going to be the MacArthur Bates, which truly is binary. So well, you don't observe this element here. What you observe is 0 if this guy is less than or equal to 0. And then you observe 1 if this guy here is greater than 0. That's what you do. What you're trying to do is to estimate the variances of each one of those terms the alphas and the betas. Look that here I don't actually have an alpha and I don't have a beta because I fixed the location and the scale to be in terms of uh, age of development, okay? And this is already done here, okay? Uh, step number three is I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, um, MacArthur Bates and I'm now going to choose the items for the elicitation instrument. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to choose nine words from the MacArthur Bates. Why nine words? Because I, the MacArthur Bates has 100 words. If I asked the 100 words for each one of the four scenarios, they would have to give 400 words. Not going to be a good idea if you're running a, a survey. Okay, so you have to be careful in what you're going to do. So I'm going to choose three words that are easy, being alpha is high, three words that are moderate difficulty, alpha, alpha is average, Three words that are hard, alpha is actually low. And these are the nine words I'm going to use in my um, elicitation instrument. So I'm going to say for a scenario, for a given scenario of H0 and, S, and X, at what age will they learn these three words? 
At what age will they learn this me, uh, medium difficulty words? At what age will they learn the hard words? Okay. Then I'm going to say, now let me change the scenarios for you. And I'm going to ask them again the same types of questions. Okay. So scenario one, um, age zero is going to be low. What I mean by this is that at baseline, the child understands only easy words. And not that the child says, really uh, the child understands easy words. Um, and X1 is low. We, we actually have a picture that shows exactly to the parent what we mean by low, few materials, few activities. Um, scenario 2 H series low, X1 is high. Scenario 3 H series high, uh, X1 is low. Scenario 4 H0 is high, X1 is high. And here's what I mean by high and low. Um, these are uh, data from uh, the uh, baseline uh, that they did. This is the distribution of uh, the uh, MacArthur Bates uh, scores. We're going to call this low, and we're going to call this high, and we're going to explain to them in words what it means to say low and high. And then this is the uh, distribution of uh, investments at baseline. This is what we're going to pick up as low. This is what we're going to pick up as high. And then we have beautiful pictures that told them the story, what we meant by high and low. This was done in the pilot with a similar population to better to make sure that whatever measure we want to understand, them to understand, they, they understood it uh, without uh, uh, ambiguity. Okay? Um, and now the elicitation instrument is going to be done like this. Suppose, uh, given scenario for H0 and X, at what age do you think the child will speak the words easy? The words that are moderately difficult, the words that are uh, uh, hard. Okay? Uh, so for every combination of uh, H0 and X, the parents answer three questions. Uh, I'm going to call A, little i, little d, little s, the age reported by mother i for uh, word difficulty level d, where scenario was s. So I'm going to have 12 of those, uh, those guys. How do I now go to the thing that I am? So and this is the instrument, by the way. Um, this is um, the simplest thing that one could do. We, we didn't think it was a good idea to do this on a tablet. So this is a cutting board that is put together, uh, two cutting boards put together. Here are, um, uh, this is uh, one scenario. This is another, sorry. This is one scenario. This is another scenario. One scenario, another scenario. Scenario one, two, three, and four. These are easy. Medium, difficult, easy, medium, difficult, e and so on and so forth. Um, as in Philadelphia, parents really enjoyed answering these questions. Um, in Philadelphia, we uh, had many parents who said, I understand what you want to ask me. Um, you're interested in whether this is nature versus nurture. <laughs> Even though they were high school dropouts, most of them, that's, uh, that's when we realized that they really had understood the notion of more or less what we actually wanted to ask them. Uh, here, parents really enjoyed much more than in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, they had to answer the questions 16 questions four times. When they were answering the 16th time, they were not so happy. Uh, here, we only asked them 12 times, so uh, we understood that 16 times is not good. Um, um, and it's usually the case that uh, we didn't instruct them on how to actually answer the survey. But many parents, what they did was they first answered this. And then they first, and then they went back and contrast. So this is low, low, and then this is uh, uh, this is high, high. So many parents, what they did is, I'm going to do the low, low first, and then I'm going to do the high, high next, and then I'm going to do the two in between. This is amazingly common in Philadelphia and in, and in Columbia, even though no one told them this is how you're going to actually answer this instrument. I I was not expecting them to have any particular way of actually uh, answering this thing. Um, so, um, and here's how we go from uh, the answers that they give to the uh, object that we are interested in. Um, I think it's easier to explain with an example. Um, here's how they, so let me show to you the two scenarios that are easier to contrast. The low, low scenario with the high, high scenario. So the moms are answering these questions for scenario one and these questions for scenario two. So let's say that for the, and by the way, they're consistent in the following way. So they understand that children are going to learn uh, easier words at younger ages. So this is typical, this is the vast majority of answers are, are going to be like this. So they're going to say, well, easy words, I think uh, it's going to be 27 months for the low, low scenario. 
but they're going to learn faster for the higher scenario. So it's going to be 23 months. Um, for the medium words, I think that they're going to be a little bit, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. So they're going to go a little bit, it's going to take them a little bit longer. But if they actually do the medium, if it's the higher scenario, it's going to be faster than here. And the hard words is going to be older than this. But if the, it's the high scenario, it should be way lower than this. So this is the typical answer that they give. Okay? Here's something that developmental psychologists have known for 50 years. Parents tend to report ages that are too old for when kids actually are going to learn things. This has been done since the 1960s. It's something that Vygotsky was really worried about because he thought if parents don't know how to answer these questions, we should, let, we should not let parents raise their children. Uh, so so they, he, he actually had a fantastic quote in his book about uh, parents not being able to raise kids because they don't know when kids are learning things. Um, what we, we then go to the data and say, at what age should children typically learn these words? Okay? Um, and we don't have a good way to estimate this for scenarios because unfortunately these scenarios are very low probability scenarios uh, when you combine them. So you don't get a very uh, 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 um, reliable estimate. So we're going to do this uh, as typical. And then they're going to be the same numbers here and here. And, here, and if parents were doing OK, uh, you would imagine that what would happen is, well, in the low, low scenarios, they certainly are going to learn at later ages than typical. But in the high, high scenarios, they should learn at younger ages than typical, right? But no, parents tend to overestimate the age children actually learn those things. So regardless of whether it's low, low, or high, high, or low, high, high, low scenarios, they're going to um, have a developmental delay, which is going to be the difference between the number that they uh, report here and the number that uh, we are interested in here. Okay? So when I change the scale in step one so that the location is scale, so that everything is in terms of developmental age, at follow-up one, children had the development of typical 36-month-old babies, uh, children. So the chronological and the developmental age is appropriate for 36 months for that particular population. Um, I'm going to say the developmental age that the mom, mom thinks is the chronological age minus the difference in developmental delay. So uh, it's going to be 31 because it's 36 minus 5 because that's the five-month developmental delay that this mom associates for this word in this scenario. 30 here, 29 here, 35 here, 34 here, 33 here. And what I'm going to do in the end is I'm going to take a log of these numbers and I'm going to come up with these guys here. Ideally, I would like all of these numbers should be exactly the same and all of these numbers should be exactly the same uh, because that would be great in terms of not having measurement error, in terms of beliefs. Uh, as you can see here, typically this is not what we're going to have, but we're not going to have tremendous amount of uh, uh, vari uh, variability that is going to say this number is going to be 31 and this number is going to be 17. So it's some variability, but not that large. But I'm still going to be concerned about this. I'm going to address this in a proper way. Here's how I'm going to address this. Um, really. What I'm going to take these numbers to be is not a direct measurement of this animal that I'm interested in, but an error reader rhythm measure, uh, measure of this animal that I am interested in. Um, here's, and I'm going to define the measurement error as the difference between what mothers are reporting to me and what mothers really think they would like to report if they understood the question as well as I would like them to understand. Okay. Now, I have a parametric formulation for this guy here. I'm just going to replace this parametric formulation in here. And what I'm going to get in the end is just a simple factor model um, with a particular uh, characteristic. Uh, these are the factors that I am interested in. And the factor loadings are identified already. They are fixed by me. This is 1. This is the scenario for H0. This is the scenario for X, Okay, um, which means that I can be a lot more flexible in uh, my assumptions about measurement error than usually are because I don't actually have to worry about identifying factor loadings to begin with. So this is how we're going to account for measurement error. Um, let me show you uh, the type of uh, some statistics about the answers that moms give. So you start with low H0, low X, that's scenario number one. Uh, easy, medium, difficult, 18, 23, 29. 
Then they would answer this guy here, which is going to be high and high, and they would say 13 and a half versus 18, 16 and a half uh, and 7 uh, versus 23 and a half, 20.3 versus 29.5. And then how they actually arrive at, uh, in between, I have no idea, but it, it's important because this is where most of the information is going to come from. By the way, completely uh, well-defined uh, distributions. There is a problem because uh, the minimum was zero, but the maximum was 48, and many parents actually, a lot of parents actually reported 48 months, which is completely unrealistic unless the children had severe developmental language delays, um, which brings this problem of uh, this very asymmetric distribution here because many parents are actually reporting 48 months, uh, no matter what. Um, returns to investment, this is the difference between high and low scenarios for investment for each one of the levels of, yeah. Okay, so going back to the, 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 the description statistics there, I think the scenarios yeah. on this tablet here. Yeah. And applies by these situations. I mean, I guess what, I, what I'm wondering is how robust that would have been had you, for example, given each of them a different tablet or randomized the order of the tablets, uh -huh. how much we would have actually seen that kind of, how much that, that monotonicity would be Yeah. When we do kind of scales on beliefs like this and other studies where we're kind of giving them one at a time uh -huh. and changing the scenario, you look at something that's, you know, got the smooth monotonicity that you've got in terms of that kind of difference. I mean, it's Establishing yeah. that they want, you know, the, that second high group to be a certain number of points higher than the other. Yeah. Yes. So, so I, let me, I, we didn't, we, we, what we did in Colombia uh, was a subset of, of what you're asking me. So the first thing that we started in Colombia was presenting them probabilities about what is the probability they will learn this word by age 36 months, okay? Then we had the easy words, medium words, hard words. We tried a different number of variations of that. We didn't get any monotonicity at all, particularly because they didn't understand the concept of probability, okay? And normally, you can address this by giving them easy examples. Didn't work either um, at all. So they would say, you know, in the next 30 days, how many days do you think, you know? And then we tried, if you suppose that you have 10 children, how many of them will, didn't work either? But I can tell you that in Philadelphia, we tried a number of different things. We tried uh, um, presenting them first only one scenario, all items, okay? Then we tried exactly what you saw. And when you ask them probability, a very interesting thing happens, which is if it is the high scenario, regardless of how difficult the task is, it's 80%. 80% chance that this is going to be done, okay? When you present me with the low scenario, 20% chance that this is going to be done. And if you ask them, what is the probability this child will be able to prove uh, Einstein's, you know, last paper, <laughs> if the scenario is high, 80%, regardless of how difficult the test is going to be. And then the two other numbers, higher or lower, depended on what they believe was more important, whether Initial conditions are investment, okay? That's, that's the notion. But it didn't really matter uh, when you ask them probabilities. In Philadelphia, we also asked age ranges. We tried something else. What is the youngest age and the oldest age? When we asked the question in that way, if you presented only, only items for a given scenario, it made a lot of difference on how they actually answered the questions. But I am really interested in the difference between these scenarios, not in the levels of the scenarios. So when you look at the difference, the differences are not that large. Not statistically, the levels are statistically significantly different from one, one way of asking the questions versus the other. But after you actually look at the difference between scenarios, that is no longer statistically significant, which doesn't prove anything, right? Um, maybe the measurement error is so large and correlated in such a way that when you take the differences, the measurement error just overpowers everything that you want to prove to begin with. Uh, that is going to certainly go, uh, could be one conclusion. But a lot of the notions that 
people would be worried about this instrument, really, in this case here, is not going to be as prevalent because of worried about differences, not worried about the levels that they're giving me, okay? So, yeah, sure. Different, sure. And I guess what you, the way you ask them is, when will they, when will they understand the word? If the scenario is this, and the scenario is really engagement between the parent and the child, for sure. But, but I'll tell you this, um, great question. Um, <laughs> when I started this project, I had very preconceived notions of what parents thought about. Uh, I really thought this is about uh, information that they had. Nowadays, I think it's not so much about information, but really, cultural beliefs about what they, th what they learn from their parents, the way children learn things, not necessarily the real way people, and, and which means a lot in terms of interventions. So if, you, if, if it is culture and you just tell them, do this, not clear that they're gonna do a lot more. They might do, some of them might do a lot more. Some of them that are more uncertain might react in particular ways. Some of them that have very fixed beliefs might not, uh, depends on the social network that they have. But more specific to your point about language development, one of the studies that we are doing in Philadelphia is particularly beliefs about language development because we have an intervention. And part of that intervention is explaining to them language development and how TV influences language development. And I can tell you that it's very interesting because the scenarios that we constructed are scenarios exactly along the lines that we are, you're describing. So one child is going to spend uh, two hours a day in, uh, uh, having conversations with people, and this is two hours in a 16 hour period, not necessarily continuously, and one hour of TV. And then the other scenario is two hours of TV, one hour of conversation. And what we are showing in that intervention is that we are changing parental beliefs tremendously as a result of uh, the intervention. But that intervention has particular information about the con how TV influences language development. To me, what's really difficult in formalizing the notion that you're asking me is because this curriculum is so vast, because it's 18 months of weekly interventions. So they talk about so many different things that it would be very difficult for me to pinpoint one particular component as we were doing in Philadelphia, which is strictly about language development. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So, so yeah. Um, but uh, I, what I want to, you know, most, many, many, many families in Philadelphia, they reported to us, you're interested in na nature versus nurture. They went straight to that, uh, to that composition. So much so that I've been thinking of maybe what I should assume is uh, some form of a even more restricted version of the production function in which the coefficients on uh, H0 and X sum up to one because of this notion that they actually are reporting to us, okay? So uh, differences in returns, um, it's interesting. This is uh, the opposite of what we found in Philadelphia. Parents believe that their returns are a little bit higher, um, f the returns to investment are a little bit higher I in the scenarios in which the levels of investments are low, okay? So uh, the level of uh, uh, H0 is low versus high. Uh, no differences between control and treatment which already tells you that the differences in investments cannot be uh, explained by differences in beliefs because of the intervention. The intervention did not change belief, parental beliefs. Um, uh, there is, uh, it's very hard to understand why, they, why it didn't. But let me give you a sense of the difference uh, between objective estimated production function versus what parents believe, the typical parent believes the production function is going to be. So this is uh, an easy estimate to do. It's basically the stuff that I did with Heckman and Shenak, but it, here it's a little bit easier just because uh, it's only one period uh, and we have a very strong instrument which is uh, the treatment, a random assignment to treatment versus control. So if you do scaled, I mean this is really 
using age, developmental age as the location they scale. And then this is a standardized meaning. Everything is mean zero variance one, typically what we report in the literature. Okay, so maybe it's easier to explain this thing here. Um, first stage means the log, of, uh, the log of investment is the dependent variable. The treatment dummy is going to be the instrumental variable. And then what you get is a, a, a T statistic of about three, which is what we would like to get if you're doing IV. That's like a unwritten rule to make sure that you don't have weak instruments. And the second stage is H, log of H1 is the de uh, dependent variable, log of H0 and log of X as the independent variables. And what you get is um, if you double human capital uh, at baseline, uh, human capital at um, uh, follow-up one should be should increase by about 38 percent. If you double investment, human capital should increase by about 74 percent of a standard deviation. That's 73 percent of a standard deviation. That's those are the figures that we're getting from uh, uh, the Columbia uh, data. It's way higher than what we get, what we got with uh, Heckman and Shenak. With Heckman and Shenak, we got this number to be about 40 percent. Um, and this number uh, here should be a little bit, uh, a little bit higher, close to 60 percent. Okay, so these numbers are showing that, at least in Colombia, uh, investment should be uh, higher. When you do parents, uh, when you ask parents what they think this is, uh, this production function is, then what you get, the best fit model would be a Cobb Douglas uh, versus something that would be what we call a translog. Um, 46% uh, of a standard deviation is the impact of human cap H0 at uh, H1. And then instead of 73%, it's 27%. When we did in Philadelphia, um, the same thing happened. So parents believed that the production function, the impact of investment on human capital formation was way lower than, uh, but not by a factor of three, more like a factor of two. It's way, way lower. And it's, it doesn't seem that the intervention actually did anything to change this. Um, they are looking at the data for the baseline, for this follow-up too, uh, and we'll soon know if uh, the intervention actually had any lasting impact on, uh, on investment. Uh, these numbers here would suggest no. These numbers, the fact that there is no change in belief suggests no, there shouldn't be any impact on uh, uh, investments. Okay? Um, and Beliefs uh, correlate only with maternal cognitive skills, exactly as we found in uh, Philadelphia, and they predict investment by exactly the same amounts as we looked in Philadelphia. So it's not different from what we found in Philadelphia. I was hoping that the home visitation program was going to change parental beliefs, no impact on parental beliefs. Okay. Let me go to paper two, um, because this is fascinating. Um, stunting is still prevalent in the world. There are about 300 million children who are stunted. Uh, the reason why we care about stunting is not because we care about height directly, it's because stunting is a signal that the body is uh, not receiving enough nutrients or experiencing so much disease that energy that should go for brain development is actually being used to, uh, uh, to help the body heal. Um, and in the last 10 years, uh, Peru, uh, which had a very high rate of stunting, went from about 30% to about 15% uh, stunting rates in a, in, a, in a period of 10 years. How is it that they did this? Uh, the, this is a, an, an initiative of uh, USAID, uh, WHO, and the World Bank, um, and UNICEF. What's really interesting is um, they identified that parents in uh, many locations in Peru believed that the reason why their children were stunted was because of genetics. Oh, we have genes that lead to our children be, we are very small and uh, therefore our children are going to be very small. Certainly genes, certainly height has a component of genes, but stunting is not genetic, right? Variability in height is genetic, but stunting is not genetic. Stunting is, uh, it's it, it, not, Obviously, uh, you know, there are certain conditions that lead to stunting, but generally it's not. Um, and for a period of five years, what they did in Peru was, okay, we're going to randomly select a few of these locations, and we're going to tell parents that stunting is not genetic. That's number one. Um, in the first year of their life, children should grow 24 centimeters. 
in the second year of their life, children should grow 12 centimeters. And by the time that the ch child uh, 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 turns two, the child should be at least 80 centimeters tall. Okay. Hmm? Yeah? 80. 80 centimeters, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and, and here are the kind of food that you need to actually do this. So in the first six months, you're going to breastfeed your child. And after the child is breastfed, you're going to start giving them some protein. Okay? And by the way, here are the protein-rich uh, foods that you can find in our region that's cheap. And by the way, every month, I need you to come and bring the child. So we're going to measure the child and tell you, is your child on track for 24, 12, 80, or your child not on track for 24, 12, 80? And every child that was measured, they actually had a poster at the entrance of the health, uh, public health clinic, and they said, on track, not on track, on track, not on track, on track, not on track. When they, study, when they start this, most of the children are not on track, red. Over time, it becomes green, on track, on track, on track, on track. So after five years, they present the results to the federal government. They say, here are the locations we randomly selected to be part of this program. Here are the locations we didn't, the control. In the control five years ago, 80% of the kids were stunted. Today, 80% of the kids are stunted. Five years ago, the treatment kids, the treatment villages, 80% of them were stunted. Nowadays, only 15% of them are actually stunted. So it's not genetic and can be done in this way, okay? So it's super fascinating. Uh, uh, they created very compelling videos uh, that they would show to communities, trying to tell them this is not genetic, and this is about disease, it's about food. Uh, if your child is sick, bring your child to the clinic. Every month you come, we measure, we give you feedback about what you have to do, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, it's interesting because um, Jerry Berman uh, uh, worked with uh, some, has been working with some, uh, some, uh, some of his co-authors on, 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 a, on, a, on a project that it started in the late 19th century. And by the way, it was so successful that the World Bank decided to create versions of the uh, videos for every single Latin American country that had, that have uh, uh, high um, um, uh, stunting rates, but they didn't but they didn't uh, copy the uh, health clinic and the measurement, the monthly measurement. And so they didn't do the parental feedback about this is what you need to do. They only copy the video, which I don't think is enough uh, in, in, in many locations. But uh, you can, you can I, if you're interested, I can show you. I have all versions of all videos, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, etc. cetera. Um, so, but um, this was a nutritional supplement uh, trial. Um, uh, that uh, in Guatemala that it started in 1969 and lasted until 1977. Here it truly was a, at this time, it's not clear that the uh, nutritionists uh, nutritionist had proof that protein is so important for growth. So this is one of the studies that they used to actually pinpoint the importance of protein. Um, they created something that was called a tole, which is very high in uh, protein. And they created something else which they called Fresco, which is not high in protein. I believe it's high in sugar, but they never actually confirmed this, <laughs> this suspicion that I have. Uh, just by the description, it looks like uh, this. Um, yeah. Oh, you, you did? See, you're tall and you're in Stanford. And <laughs> oh, okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Hey, that's what I thought. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So that, that so I I actually asked them this question. They never answered me straight. Like, oh, and they answered a lot more difficult questions than that. So thank you for answering me. Um, I have a lot more questions that I have to ask you. Uh, but he's he's. Um, um, it's very interesting because um, the description of the study is something that I that I thought one day maybe I'll be able to do this. Um, you know, I'll have the money to be able to do this. But it truly, uh, they measured the initial height of all children that were born in, during the period of the study or at entry in the study, and then uh, kids were between uh, up to two years old. 
they actually uh, were measured uh, every two months and then uh, caloric intake every three months in the first two years. So truly is uh, something quite, uh, quite, quite interesting. Um, they, they collect the detailed data on prices of, at the community level of eggs, chicken, pork, beef, dry beans, corn and rice. Uh, these data were sitting at, a, at an office in, uh, in Guatemala that we were able to, we, we, we decided to ask them for a different project. Would you have by any chance collected data on prices of any of the food sources and said, wow, we collected everything, but no one actually digitized this, but we can send you every, you know, every file that we have. Then we get this, you know, paid graduate students to actually transcribe this. Uh, I was a little bit uh, worried that they would make mistakes, so I made sure that we had four graduate students transcribing and typing everything. We found many mistakes, were able to correct them. Uh, they didn't, the graduate students didn't know that they were working on this project <laughs> and there was someone else replicating what they were doing. Um, here is the fundamental assumption. If I could go back in time, I would ask parents, what do you think the appropriate height is going to be at two years? But we can't. So instead of actually having data on prior beliefs, I'm going to make an assumption. Adaptive expectations. Now, this is not a terribly bad assumption. Um, the literature in medical areas, especially in the United States, they have shown many uh, pieces of evidence that suggest that parents should have rational, uh, some form of adaptive expectations when it relates to height and especially uh, obesity. Okay? Um, um, the, uh, the compelling uh, stories that you see is that parents judge their children to be obese based on the obesity level of uh, their peers. So if ch children who are obese have obese peers, parents are likely to say that their child is not obese. Parents that have no obese child but ha and have peers that are less obese than their, their child will actually be more likely to say that their child is actually obese, even though the child is actually not obese. Um, we have a large description of this literature um, in uh, medical areas that pinpoint the notion that it's adaptive expectations. Uh, as things change over time, parental expectations also change over time uh, in, 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 in areas of health. Um, this is going to be very. This is going to be a super important assumption for me to actually be able to uh, for us to be able to do this. And the assumption here is uh, the reference point is going to be the fo determined in the following way. Okay, my child is born today. I'm looking at two-year-olds that live in the village. I'm going to say that the reference point for me is the mean of the children who are two years old today. Okay. Um, if I had previous children, I knew about them, I would just update this, uh, this information. Okay. Uh, but what I am not is the following. What I'm not doing is I'm going to use changes in the past to forecast what heights are going to be in the future. That I can't allow, okay? Uh, and it could be natural to, uh, to do this in certain context, especially it's, if it's a non-stationary context. But if I allow for this, then I can't identify the importance of reference points. So the important assumption here truly is adaptive expectations. Uh, if you don't like this, then you have to collect data on prior beliefs that they have about children. At the moment that children are born, what you think the height is going to be at age two, okay? Um, and then if you have, if you give me this uh, assumption of adaptive expectations, then this implies two exclusion restrictions. One is the random assignment to treatment and control, but the second is the interaction between random assignment and calendar time, okay? So T and uh, random, T times random assignment is going to be an exclusion restriction. Random assignment is going to be another exclusion restriction. The system here is nonlinear, but it can be estimated as a nonlinear inst uh, instrumental variables type of argument in which you would do generalized method of moments. So that's, that's, it's, it's that simple, uh, but it relies on this assumption, okay? Let me show to you what really is interesting here. Um, this is uh, total protein consumption um, for control and treatment villages. Um, this includes, for the treatment villages, it includes not only the protein that they consumed in the health, uh, in, the, in the community center, but also, in, uh, but also at home. And this is, the, uh, this is why the recall is so important. Okay, so the control group, we don't see any trend on this. 
The treatment group, we actually see this upward trend in protein uh, uh, choice. Most of the work that has been done, they collapse all of the years, and they report changes in height at age, uh, by age two years by analyzing across all birth years. Uh, but really, there is no impact for the early cohorts. There is an impact for the uh, uh, older cohorts. And the impact is larger the, older co uh, the, 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 the more recent the cohort is going to be. Okay? So the model doesn't do too great a fit when we look at um, uh, early parts of, uh, early parts of uh, uh, the experiment. It overpredicts what the height should be. So I don't want you to be thinking too much about um, uh, the results for, years, uh, for the uh, cohort born in year 1970. But for the year 1971 and above, this is not so bad. Okay? Um, the same thing for protein choice. Um, not so bad. Um, um, so here's, here's the, me so what is the, what is going on here? What's going on is the following. The first parents that get the protein, they have not so much high expectations. And what happens is they consume some protein and their children turn out to be higher than the children that were born a few years before. Now, the, the parents now that have a child, they're looking at the new children. They're saying, well, the new children are actually higher than the older children. So that means that the reference, what I consider to be normal, is going to be higher. Therefore, I have to improve the protein intake of my children. So I'm going to consume more of this protein. That in turn leads the children to grow more which is going to then tell the new parents, oh my God, this children grow so much, I have to con continue to consume. Now I have to give even more protein, which is then is going to. So the mechanism that we're do doing here is really a mechanism of social learning in which one is looking at the, pa the, action, the past actions of the previous generation and use the past actions to update the, what they should be doing now. And this is all this very complicated social learning aspect of it is built, is built in in two components here. One is the reference point, and the other one is the adaptive expectation. It is because of this social learning that I need the adaptive expectations. If you don't give me adaptive expectations, I then don't know what, what is social learning anymore from what is just updating of uh, expectations that would happen, even if there was no social learning whatsoever. Okay, So uh, that is. Uh, that is the fundamental part of the problem. So we, what's really interesting is we can go back because we know the protein, uh, inta the protein of each food component, uh, protein content of each food source that they gave children, and we know the prices of each food source. We can say how much does this particular diet that is rich in this amount of protein cost the parents, and then let's see what they're getting from the atoli and let's see what is the kind of discount that the atoll is giving parents so that they consume a larger fraction of protein spending less money. And what we find is that uh, what, the pro what, the, what the intervention is doing is just basically reducing protein price in the treatment villages by about 42% versus the control group. So you can do the, the, the in our model, uh, a Similar intervention would be one in which prices would be, uh, be reduced by 42%. Prices are lower. Everyone is going to consume more protein. Everyone is going to grow more. This is a dangerous way to model things just because the social learning might be happening precisely because everyone is going to the center to get food. And it's precisely because everyone is get, going to the center that you might see that the children are growing faster. Okay? So if you just give the discount, maybe they would consume more food at home these are rural villages, not necessarily they would see every child growing more, okay? But in any case, 42% of the protein price. Here is, um, Michael Waters like this part of the graph, I prefer this, uh, this part of the graph. Here is what we're doing. Here is we're just plotting how many more centimeters they're getting uh, versus the previous cohort. So the first cohort was born in 1969, the second cohort 1970, the third cohort 1971. Don't want to work with the 1970 cohort because our model doesn't do that good of a job. But uh, the 71 cohort, uh, in comparison to the 1970, uh, 1969 cohort, grew about 1.3 centimeters. 50% okay. uh, of the growth is because of, uh, uh, is because of uh, the social learning. 
50% of the growth is because of the redu uh, reduction in price that leads to more consumption of protein, even in the, in the absence of, uh, uh, of social learning, okay? But as time goes by, uh, the cohorts are becoming bigger. You can't explain more consumption by differences in prices because the prices are actually the same across cohorts. Uh, it has to be the social learning mechanism if you give me the adaptive expectation. So the 1975 cohort is grown by almost two centimeters um, at age two years, but 60% of this growth is actually because of the social learning and only 40% now is because of uh, the uh, differences in prices. So what's going on here is the notion of if you're going to have some learning, you have to provide some way for parents to figure out this learning. What really surprises me in a lot of the home visitation literature that I've seen is that there's no feedback about how much children are learning and how much of the learning is because of things that the parents are doing with the children. If you don't tie these two pieces of mechanisms, I don't see how you can actually change parental beliefs. Yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. Uh huh. We can't. IRB would not allow us to do this. <laughs> Uh huh. In a bad way, yeah. Oh, that happens all the time for sure. In yeah, in a quasi experimental fashion, yeah. It would be nicer if you could almost see that kind of similar type of situation where the price reduction is happening, but you're not getting you're getting an increase in consumption as a result of the price change. Uh huh. But you're and because they're you know kind of buying something, but the reference points aren't happening, right? No. And 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 so there's no change in reference. It's fun, but in some sense. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, in, in, in I can imagine doing uh, the following uh, type of experiment. One experiment is one in which you do some form of treatment in a private setting, and you do another experiment, the same intervention, but in a in a in a, in a um, social setting, right? So uh, philosophers have written more about beliefs that I can understand, but they have learned, they, there is something that, they, that seems to be consistent across uh, philosophy in belief formation, which is the following. I know that you know, and you know that I know, and I know that you know that I know, and you know that I know that I, you know that I know. So this sense of, uh, uh, of um, uh, making sure that people are getting the same message and everyone knows that everyone is getting the same message is the way that philosophers have suggested and have done in some experiments, people actually change beliefs, okay? I have no sense of whether this is true here because they never collected data on beliefs, right? But I can imagine the situation in which you induce this common knowledge, as they call it, by either doing the experiment in a one-to-one -one setting, which by the way is how home visitation actually works, versus in a setting in which it's many-to-one and everyone is learning that everyone is getting the same message and everyone is buying that everyone is getting the same message, okay? Uh, that is the type of experiment in the language environment that we're doing in Philadelphia. Everyone, it's almost like if you enter this, it's a religious program. <laughs> but it's a religious program because I think that based on the literature and philosophy, this is the only way that, they can actually ch that you can actually change parental beliefs. Preliminary results show that we actually are changing not only parental beliefs, but we're also changing uh, uh, behavior. Um, I have not... I want to do the other experiment in which it's exactly the same intervention, but one-to-one -one setting. I just don't have the money to do it, but I'm, I'm trying to raise the money. So if you have like a million dollars, we can do it uh, next week. Um, start next week. Just have to do the IRB it's approval. Part of, part of the thing I think that, though, is, is there's other settings where this actually, you can actually imagine similar settings where people are doing something. Like, I think, like I work in Paul Jackson's, right? Uh-huh. And so there's two things, like right? they're changing the, price, the relative prices of, of education. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly.
exactly. Exactly. So, 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 so um, this is the notion in which it's more than just information, right? It truly is uh, identity, right? It, it truly is culture. Uh, it's trying to get people to coordinate and accept that this is actually acceptable, or that we agree that this information actually happens. When, when one of the one of the biggest concerns that I had when we were doing, you know, people were telling me just do a randomized control trial, and I'm like. Really, I am an economist. I'm going to go to a mom and I'm going to tell her this is really important stuff. She's going to start laughing at me like, oh, you have no idea. What's really interesting is if you actually go and talk to them, and we did some, uh, some uh, uh, um, focus groups, one of the most fascinating things is that it was not an information question, but it's a broader question. That's something else that happens in this context, which is, um, and it, I had a hard time understanding this until a mom told me, I understand that this is important. But put yourself in my shoes. I live in a neighborhood that is extremely dangerous. When I want my child to, when I see that there is a danger in my neighborhood and my child is on the street, and when I tell him, blah, come in right now, I don't want him to start saying, yeah, mom, but why would you need me to go in right now? I mean, I am here with my friends. So give me a good explanation. And <laughs> no, I need him to just get in and not ask a question. So if you see me doing a lot of directive speech, it's because directive speech is what I need him to do so that he reacts in a way that I can protect him from the danger that I see. This is one aspect of the problem that seems that they are concerned about a broader sense of development than we are as you know, me as a theorist. Here's another one. If you go back to 1920s, Lind and Lind, two sociologists, they did this fantastic ethnographic study. It keeps being re redone every 50 years. Okay? And the ethnographic study is the following. They, at that point in time, they already understood that parents have very different ways of raising children in terms of the um, skills that they actually uh, would like their children to acquire. Blue collar skills, uh, uh, blue collar worker parents wanted um, discipline. Um, perseverance, um, reliability from their children. That's what they believed it was important for them. White collar parents, what I want is creativity, imagination, uh, learning how to ask the right questions and learning how and knowing how to actually uh, answer those questions. Okay? See, 40 years later, Khan goes back and says, why are you doing this? Well, my child will be a blue collar worker. He will need discipline, perseverance, reliability. Why are you doing this? Well, my child will be a lawyer, a physician, et cetera, et cetera. Which is, again, another notion of how these beliefs are formed. Well, these beliefs are maybe formed based what on a lot more things than just information that I can tell them about the returns. It truly is about what is the what, what are the parents forecasting that their children are going to do? What are the kinds of skills that they think that their children will need the most? So I think that we're just touching the surface here. But, but, but I don't think anymore that it's just a story of information. I think that there is some component of information for very specific settings, like the language, NTV. If you show parents, this is what the research shows, oh, okay, I get it. But that's very specific to language development at a very specific age. But for broader constructs, I don't think that we know the answer to these things. And it's, it doesn't seem to me just information. Some of it is forecasting what the world is going to be. Other is going to be what is the identity? Is this consistent with the, you know, with the people that I interact with in my social network and so on and so forth? Um, sorry. I mean, it's, I, I don't have a. Right? I mean, I wish I had like a, when I started this project, I thought I solved poverty in the world. <laughs> Nowadays, I don't think, I don't even think that I've solved the problem in my head. So, um, so let, me, uh, let me stop here. Um, there is a problem that, I am, that drives me every day, which is we have huge heterogeneity investments in children. A lot of these investments are not driven by money. Um, I told you about language. I could, tell, I could tell you about sleep. This is like the, the lowest hanging fruit. If children don't have actually good, 
sleep, forget about learning anything, okay? And yet, one of the first things that I found out when we attached a, a recording device to the children's clothing, uh, and we asked the parents to record a few days of the week, we were surprised to see the variability in the time that they actually went to bed and there was silence, okay? Uh, no child vocalization whatsoever. One day was 6 p.m., the other day was 3 a.m., the other day was 9 p.m., the other day was 1 a.m. No, and we did this again because I thought we did something wrong with this family. We did this again and the same thing happened. I wish that I could tell you that this is only 3% of the families, the low-income families, it's not. It's way more prevalent. Um, it's not a question of only about giving parents more money. Money can uh, get them better living arrangements, but I do think that there is something else beyond money uh, in this context. Um, so understanding huge heterogeneity investments that we have, we understand about 10 to 15% of the heterogeneity investments. If you really want to uh, include all the variables that we observe about parents and children, you would explain 15%. And I don't think 85% is measurement error. This is after you accounted for whatever measurement error you already identified from the data, which is actually very large. It's twice the variance of measurement error is as large as the variance of investment. Even after you accounted for the variance of measurement error, you still know only about 15% uh, of this, uh, this uh, heterogeneity. Um, uh, my sense when I started this heterogeneity beliefs is going to be a major explanation of uh, heterogeneity investments. I think that we went from 15% to maybe 17%, <laughs> uh, but it's not, uh, it still has a lot to go. Um, high quality home visitation program, and I'm not, I'm not saying only about Colombia. We're doing one in Brazil. We're doing another one in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Houston. In Brazil, the social learning is an aspect that, I, that we fought very hard with the school district, uh, with the Secretariat of Education to include, because I was convinced that this notion of com common knowledge had to be part of any, any program that is going to try to affect parental beliefs. So um, it's instead of having a home visitation every week, it's one, one week is a home visitation. The other week, all parents go to this community center and they receive the same message and they look at each other and they see that each other is getting the message. Do you understand? Do you understand? Do you understand? Are you gonna do this? Are you gonna? So it's, again, it seems like religion, but truly it's not. Um, the stuff that we're doing in Houston, the school district uh, was so much into it that they forgot about, they, they said, let's cancel the one-to-one -one home visitation because we did an evaluation for them, showed no impact whatsoever. They now moved this entirely as uh, within the school. So parents come within the school once a week, and then they receive the training, they receive uh, the materials that they need to do with the children, and then the other week they actually show to other parents how they actually did uh, with the children, and then you know the children now show to their other children I, I know how to do this now. My mom taught me. Uh, and that makes uh, a lot of the other moms so guilty that they actually quit the program, which is also not helpful. Um, uh, so um, reference points, uh, if you give me this assumption of um, uh, rational expe uh, adaptive expectation seem to be inducing some form of uh, uh, social learning, which then drives uh, uh, investments, and then um, the existence of these reference points and these update rules suggest that really we're talking about these models that may have tipping points. So if you convince enough people that this actually, this value is actually not, this is not the true value that you should be working with, this is this higher value here, these tipping models have this notion that uh, the equilibrium might move from a low equilibrium to a high equilibrium. Um, uh, but more work to come in the next few years. I'll stop here. <laughs>